Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Krishna Pentakur. I'm a professor and associate chair of the Department of Economics at Simon Fraser University. I want to start this evening, uh, as is uh, very common these days, by acknowledging that we are here at SFU Vancouver on the unceded and stolen ter traditional territories of many First Nations, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations. And humans have lived in this land for at least 14,000 years. But over the past 500 years, European conquest and settlement altered the history of the first peoples of this continent. And now migration from Asia and Africa continues to profoundly affect the lives and futures of indigenous people. As a child of immigrants myself, I find myself keenly aware of the lack of violence and hatred directed at settlers like myself. It's a continued amazement. So tonight, we welcome everyone to the 2022 BMO Lecture Series. It's the first in two years we got pandemic And this year's event is jointly supported by the David and Cecilia Ting Endowment for Education for Public Responsibility and a continuing endowment from the BMO. The purpose of both endowments is to extend SFU's presence at the frontier of scientific knowledge into the communities in which we live and work. Today's presentation is a wonderful example of that mission. And thank you to our partners at SFU Public Square as well for helping put this event together. This evening, Dr. Phil Oriopoulos of the University of Toronto is going to share his work on the role of mentorship in helping students achieve success and avoid failure. He'll show how mentorship through advisors and advice can change lives and make the case that this can be done without a vast amount of public money. Dr. Oriopoulos has published many papers in top journals in economics, such as the American Economic Review and Quarterly Journal of Economics, and also contributed significantly to on-the-ground public policy debates through outlets like Canadian Public Policy. And he was awarded the Doug Purvis Memorial Prize for an outstanding contribution to Canadian public policy in 2020. He's variously served at the National Bureau of Economic Research, at the Russell Sage Foundation, and as a visiting endowed chair at Harvard University. So many, other than just us, think very highly of his work. So Phil's going to talk for 45 minutes. And I want you to save your questions, because there will be a moderated question and answer period afterwards. And mics will be made available for you uh, at that time. So the rough plan, 45 minutes for Phil, 30 minutes for you, 30, 40 minutes for food. We go. So let's welcome Phil. Okay, great. Um, okay, thanks everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting me and for all of you guys coming uh, here tonight. Uh, I have um, been thinking about some of these ideas I'm going to be presenting for some time as a collection of um, a whole bundle of the research that I've been working on. And I want to sort of share with you my growing conviction, what I have on the importance that people play in helping facilitate human capital and labor market success. So for example, uh, this is Lucas in the slides when he was four years old trying to play the, uh, the violin. And I want you to think about it just for like th three seconds. Like, would, would this guy be even touching the instrument if it weren't for his parents to actually set him up, put him in a room with uh, uh, a music teacher? And then the answer, of of course, is no, even if Lucas had the genetic endowment to be the next Mozart, he wouldn't pick up the violin. He, he, would, um, he would never take up the violin on his own uh, at this age. Actually, Mozart would never do that either. Uh, and that's because four-year-olds think in the present. Their brains aren't developed yet to think in the long run for immediate actions. And I want to emphasize here that the challenge with wanting Lucas to learn is not just to get him to practice once, right? In order to foster Lucas's musical potential, he has to practice daily. It has to become a regular part of his routine for him to benefit from the cumulative effects of the practice. 
Otherwise, getting him to practice just once or occasionally is not really going to get cut it. What Lucas needs is a helping hand, someone to help him practice every day to receive advice and instructions. Does it work? Oh. And, um, and that need for help doesn't change with time, even if Lucas starts to want to play his instrument. As the brain matures and Lucas is able to control more of his impulses and his feelings and distractions, he still has the tendency to prefer to do things right now that are more fun, like playing Minecraft or playing with his friends or anything that doesn't involve more effort or something that you know, um, uh, re requires uh, you know, something that benefits him later. And so in order to foster Lucas's um, potential, um, present distractions and preferences get in the way from realizing long-term goals. So uh, we could remind Lucas, I could send him a text message every day to try to practice, or I could try to help set him a schedule. I could try to incentivize Lucas. I could pay him to practice every day, or I could punish him. I could take away his phone if he doesn't practice. But these kinds of approaches don't go towards fostering that intrinsic motivation that he's going to need if he's going to want to practice and develop the skill over time. And so in order to encourage regular practice, Lucas needs personal assistance as he progresses, like a parent to help him take to lessons or to give him space for him to practice, or like a, a music teacher to help provide the encouragement or the feedback that's customizable to the individual, okay? If Lucas is having a problem with his, uh, uh, a piece that he's playing, just listening to a YouTube video is not gonna be nearly as effective as having that one-on-one -on -one interaction that he would get from uh, an individual. And finally, it's not just parents and teachers. Any person in Lucas's life has the potential to facilitate or hinder his practice someone close to him that provides encouragement, someone that he doesn't want to disappoint, he can motivate him and want to play. And the main message here is that for meaningful long-term progress at many things that we care about, not just practice, but succeeding in school or advancing in a career or maintaining our health, often what's required is sustained effort. And to encourage sustained effort, personal assistance that social interaction is critical for maintaining and facilitating these goals. It's this kind of assistance, um, if it doesn't come from friends or family, there could be a role for policy and programs, but figuring out how to design those programs in a way that's cost effective is going to be a challenge because this kind of personal assistance doesn't scale easily. It's expensive to provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, help. And so in this talk, my aim is to elaborate on some of these ideas about how behavioral barriers get in the way of us realizing long-term goals, and then to make the case based on recent research that the best way to help avoid these barriers is through interactive personal assistance. I'm going to go through several examples um, over the life cycle, starting with trying to help facilitate more social interaction between parent and toddler, then we'll get to the school levels, talking about how we can help uh, students learn. And then I wanna give you at least one example of applying personal assistance uh, beyond education to show you that these same concepts can be used in many other cases when we have um, actions that involve immediate costs and long-term um, uh, benefits. So as Christian said, the plan is for me to go about 45 minutes. I think I've already spent about 10 minutes talking about Lucas, but that's okay, uh, and we'll have the, uh, the Q&A afterwards. Okay. So making present decisions to improve long-term outcomes when those actions involve immediate costs is difficult. Um, there's lots of classic examples. Um, we have, uh, oh, I got this quote up, success is the sum of small efforts, and that it's gonna repeat it day in and day out, and that's gonna kind of come back. So these examples of making decisions, um, dieting is an obvious example where we kind of give up sweets to try to um, improve our long-term health. Saving, we give up immediate consumption in order to have future consumption. I 
personally think sunscreen is a good example where you have to deal with this inconvenience of putting this lathering cream on our faces uh, with the hope of protecting ourselves in the long run. And practicing, of course, studying is a big one as well. Staying home on a Friday night to study for an exam uh, is a sacrifice that a student has to make in order to uh, try to get a better grade to help them later on in the future. Now, these examples are especially the case when benefits are uncertain and when the actions involve ongoing incremental costs. So missing one day of sunscreen is not a big deal, but missing uh, sunscreen over and over again adds up. Or uh, um, studying for one hour less a week is not a big deal if it's just done once, but if that happens continuously over time, it starts to matter. And same with sunscreen. Okay? These kinds of decisions require discipline and habits that are difficult to develop. Why are they difficult? Um, for practical purposes, it often is helpful to categorize the brain thinking in two systems. Um, one system focused on the present and the other one able to think more about the future. <clears throat> so we have two broad systems, system one and system two. <clears throat> system one is working more automatically, helping us manage day-to-day -day activities, thinking fast and efficiently. It quickly and intuitively gauges current feelings. System two is tasked with anticipating how one will feel in the future. It works more deliberately and requires more effort to kind of process that way. While we benefit enormously from having a system one, we need it to kind of get by day to day and, and make uh, quick intuitive uh, actions, um, problems arise when we overuse it uh, when valuing outcomes that involve the future. So the immediate costs associated from long-term decisions are salient and relatively easy to assess, but on the other hand, future feelings seem vague and uncertain, and this imbalance leads to, or can lead to myopia, with system one downplaying the importance of future and overemphasizing the present. And this basically can be boiled down to um, leading to uh, uh, four key implications that can be summarized here. Uh, some people tend to focus too much on the present. Uh, some people rely too much on routine, at least sometimes. Some people focus too much on negative social identities. And all of this, uh, these kinds of mistakes are going to be more likely to occur when an individual is under stress, or they face many options, or there's little information, or the benefits are incremental. So um, just to give you like a few highlights of these examples, in the present moment, things can get, uh, we can get immediate pleasure from things like watching a video or social media or talking with friends. Um, these things seem much more salient and attractive to system one. Um, present decisions may be high stakes, like choosing a field of study or choosing who you're going to marry, or they may be seemingly low stakes, such as whether to study for an extra hour, but again, over time, as the benefits of learning compound, marginal decisions on how much to study um, or practice also become consequential. Second, some people remain on autopilot, relying a lot on routine. We often do this because it makes it easier to get through daily tasks without feeling mentally strained, and it also frees up bandwidth to focus on more complicated tasks, so that's good. Uh, but the problems arise when routines must be disrupted in order to take advantage of other opportunities that exist um, for improving our welfare. And another implication from following automatic thought patterns are that routines is that um, new information will only be relevant for decisions if it immediately comes to mind. Uh, as, a, as a result of systems one's automatic thinking, individuals may not even realize that they should be seeking out new information. So students, or maybe their parents, may make, be making decisions using only readily available information or options, even if other information seems relatively easy to access. Um, and then finally, an important point is that concerns about identity predominate uh, student thinking, especially in adolescence. Um, questions like, what kind of person am I? What are others like me doing? What are others like me thinking of me? 
They serve as powerful reference points for deciding how to act. And these extremely salient concerns about identity may have significant implications for how students trade off between immediate costs and long-term benefits from education. So since social interactions occur daily, both in and outside of school, from kindergarten onwards, they're frequently a priority for many students. And as a result, education decisions may overemphasize the value of immediate social gratification uh, and uh, um, miss out on long-term consequences. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Can we go back? I'm pressing it. Oh, OK. It's really sensitive. OK, I got it now, I think. Uh, unfortunately, if there's one particular group that has difficulty in uh, making these types of decisions, it's, it's kids. Um, choosing vegetables instead of bread or homework instead of play requires willpower, immediate incentives, and limiting options. But it can take 25 years before the brain matures. So what a child wants uh, changes with age, and children spend most, if not all, of their school years with less interest in the future than their future selves. And that's unfortunate, because many of the decisions that the student is making, many of the actions, are going to have long-term consequences. OK, so fortunately, while we may have difficulty making decisions involving immediate costs and long-term uncertain benefits, understanding why that happens can point to specific policies and counter behaviors that can help. In the case of the present bias, for example, making it easier and more attractive to choose actions associated with longer-term benefits can help realize them. And in the case of our tendency to rely too much on the routine, or on what's top of mind, making alternative options more salient can also help. So making desirable actions easier and more salient are key policy implications from these behavioral challenges. So you may have heard of um, the term nudge, which is popularized by Cass Sunstein in Richard Thaler's book. Um, Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize in 2017 for these uh, concepts. And a nudge is a subtle change to an individual's environment that tries to steer them into the direction of the more desirable action without meaningfully changing their options or uh, the restrictions that they face. Uh, so the underlying principle of a nudge is make it easy. Uh, make it easier to go in the direction that you want the action to happen. So one of the most successful ways to nudge is to set the right default. In other words, automatically selecting individuals into one choice option if they don't take any action. Um, that's because often we don't take any action because it's easiest to do. So defaulting someone into getting a flu shot, um, into an employer savings program, um, defaulting them into taking a particular set of courses, these things can have um, uh, a significant effect in going those directions. It works well for one-time actions, but it's not possible often to default continuous activities such as dieting or studying. Um, more common nudges are like marketing techniques, like 101, so basically making it easier through uh, reminders, providing information, sending texts or emails or pamphlets to try to encourage someone to realize things that they should be doing. Now, another approach to addressing behavior barriers is what I call a shove. Um, shoves actually do restrict an individual's option in order to make the, the op remaining options be the ones that you want uh, individuals to do. So banning uh, uh, large containers of sugary drink is a shove. Um, requiring students to attend school is also an example of a shove. Now, restricting choice can occur uh, more indirectly from deciding how to structure an individual's schedule. 
Um, so I actually view like the act of parenting or planning a child's, say, weekend schedule as sort of a shove because the child has basically no choice. The parent's kind of setting it up. And a teacher that decides what to do during the class in terms of what the curriculum is be or what information is presented is sort of a shove in the sense that the, um, the child is exposed to that information. Okay, so as an example, uh, suppose you want to get more people to use the stairs. So uh, here's this crazy picture that a lot of behavioral economists have used because it seems ridiculous that you would have an escalator going up to uh, a fitness gym. And you know, obviously when it's super easy um, and it's convenient, someone will just take the escalator. So an example of a nudge might be to make the uh, taking the stairs more fun or attractive. So in this case, uh, some, um, European subway set up uh, piano uh, stairs so that when you step on it, it makes a note, and so people like it, and it's kind of fun, and they want to uh, use it. Another example is to turn the stairs into a track, and it, again, it becomes uh, more fun to use. So these are examples of nudges. You can imagine what the shove is. The shove is just getting rid of the escalator. Um, and you know, when you think about it, this is, these are cute examples, but does it really go really far in improving someone's health over the long run? Um, compare it to having your own personal trainer that comes to your house three times a week and think about you know, which is going to generate these long-term outcomes. The nudge is cute. It has some effects on making someone, people at the margin use the stairs more, um, but over time, um, you, you can see how the nudge may have an impact. It's kind of cute and ha has a little impact, but uh, on the question of whether it generates that cumulative effect, um, maybe not so much. So when we take a closer look of nudges and shoves, they're actually not that effective when they don't involve personal interaction. They're cheap, so often they're cost effective, but if we are after more meaningful change in the long run, we can't rely on marketing 101 techniques like text messages or setting up uh, um, piano stairs uh, on their own. Uh, a meta-analysis of 126 low-touch uh, nudge experiments over the last decade um, found that an average impact on taking up a program was only about 1.4 percentage points, with the median impact of just 0.5 percentage points. So that's like um, uh, a, a nudge to increase the number of people taking flu shots by t from 20% to 21%. So really not um, that much. Shoves, like compulsory schooling and mandatory savings, are more successful at changing take up, but not always practical when we don't think everyone should be shoved in one direction. So for example, we can remove the escalators to get everyone to using it, but that's not very fair to the elderly. Um, and if we want to improve health overall, we can't exactly shove everyone to spend an hour at the gym every day. <laughs> okay, this thing is dying on me, okay. Uh, Nudges and shoves may help with one-time actions like getting vaccinated or completing an application, but facilitating learning and long-term changes to one's routine or habits requires changing behavior basically permanently. So constant reminders or information campaigns aren't going to shift routines or habits. To do that, we benefit more from this social interaction, from this personal assistance. When we need to move towards a new activity that we are uncertain about, or we don't know if we're doing it right, or we don't know if it's right for us, we benefit from a trusted expert showing us and telling us what we need to know and, and do that often. This is the case for doing taxes when we get the help of an accountant. It's the case of doing financial planning when we get the case for a financial planner. But it's also the case for parenting and getting the help for someone who's been there or done that who has uh, experience. And it's also um, the case for succeeding in high school by interacting with someone who's like a coach who's designed to help you. Someone trying to steer uh, another towards a particular action 
can express empathy, can respond to questions, can have body language, facial expression. They can provide the customized individual help where there's no one size fits all, uh, even if it's on the same thing, like you know, navigating through high school or trying to you know, figure out to be a, a good parent. One of my favorite quotes from a caseworker helping disadvantaged youth in high school is that everyone needs someone that they don't want to disappoint. So again, it's, it's a similar, or it's, it's one type of personal assistance. So the key takeaway message here is that if you want to truly generate meaningful change over the long run through a program or public policy, you're going to need to have it to include at least some kind of personal assistance. Okay, I'm going to go through some examples now. Um, for the remainder of the talk, and uh, I'm going to show you how personal assistance plays a critical role in these. So uh, let me start with the application. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, the first example is trying to increase post-secondary education uh, enrollment and persistence. And uh, when you think about it, the transition from uh, grade 11 to grade 12 is really easy. You don't have to do anything to kind of get to the next grade. But the default, if you do nothing after you finish high school, you're done. The transition to get to post-secondary is actually quite involved. You have to figure out where you want to go, what you want to study. You have to apply. Uh, you have to maybe apply for financial aid. And uh, a lot of this actually take it for granted because we have parents that actually help us give that personal assistance. But when you're, say, uh, you know, first generation student where your parents have not gone on to university or there's um, stress in the family or other things going on, you may not get that kind of personal assistance. Um, and so trying to make it easier uh, may, uh, may be useful. Uh, there have been some efforts to try to uh, nudge in this direction. For example, a recent study finds that using artificially intelligent text messages to proactively support incoming undergrads to um, actually show up uh, uh, come the fall increased um, one-time enrollment by three percentage points. Uh, and so that's pretty good, but it, um, given how much it, it costs. Another study examined several efforts to encourage hundreds of thousands of students um, uh, who signed up for the Common Application to actually uh, complete the financial aid application, get all the other things that they need to done. And the sample was so large, they got to try many different stuff. Some were sent emails, some were sent text messages, some they decided, you know, got more messages than others, some were sent mails. Um, but uh, n none of these efforts were found to have any impact on, um, uh, on actual enrollment or persistence. But the story changes when we add personal assistance. Uh, in the H&R Block FAFSA study, we had um, parents, uh, uh, low-income parents, come into H&R Block to get their taxes done who had a child in their high school who was transitioning out. Um, and uh, in one group, from the information that we collected from the taxes just there, uh, we provided the parent with an accurate estimate of how much financial aid would be available to the child if the parent or the child applied. Okay? That did nothing. But when we actually invited the parent to stick around for an extra 10 minutes and assist them in actually completing the official financial aid application form for federal student aid, one year later, that increased college enrollment or uh, university enrollment by eight percentage points. And uh, in a similar example, rather than waiting for parents to come to the h and block, instead of trying to help the parents, we could help the students directly by going to low transition high schools and incorporating into the curriculum for grade 12s a three-class effort to help get everyone apply to uh, a program. So in the Life After High School experiment, which was done in Ontario, we had, um, in the first class, we helped guide with counselors um, walking around um, 
students pick out at least three programs that they might um, find interesting and be likely to get accepted to. In the second class, the counselors help them actually apply for real with the application fee paid. And in the third class, we help them apply for financial aid. So the idea was that every student would leave exit grade 12 with an application, with an offer of acceptance from the program that they helped choose and a financial aid package. So the transition or bridge from high school to um, post-secondary becomes an easy one to take. They still have to choose if they want to take it, but now the option value becomes much real. And that program increased uh, uh, post-secondary enrollment by five percentage points. And if we just focus on the students who were not on university track, it was a nine percentage point effect. Let me just check the time. Um, the next example is about parents of preschoolers interacting more with their children. And there's a lot of research now that indicates, uh, I think, what every preschooler needs uh, to thrive. There's so basically three things. Um, they need frequent interaction uh, from a parent to help stimulate their environment, so constant talking and um, discussion, even if, the parent, even if the child isn't talking back. Uh, they need frequent exposure to new ideas and new experiences to help spark curiosity. And they need a, a safe and home environment uh, so that they feel comfortable. And uh, the, the problem with actually this stuff is it's actually not easy to do, right? As, if you're a parent, like constantly talking to your kid, it does not come naturally. And uh, a recent study shows that there's a large gap between low and high CS parents on the beliefs of the benefits of actually doing these things, and a large SES gap between low and high uh, parents in, say, the number of words spoken um, to, to the child. So uh, this is an example of a study that did two types of interventions, one with personal assistance and one without. So the one without basically had um, parents of newborns coming in to do the, the uh, um, physician visits, and they were shown four videos uh, that motivated some of these ideas. Uh, the second program had professionals actually come and visit the home, uh, and over 12 uh, visits actually interactively demonstrated some of these uh, things that the parents could do and had you know, questions and answers and uh, could discuss these benefits. And it was only the second program with personal help at home where the counselor could interact with the family and answer questions that led to significant improvement in things like vocabulary scores and measures of reading readiness. Another study uh, another study I did uh, tried to coach first-year university students uh, towards more academic success by having them go through an online exercise um, that would try to inform them and, or advise them about tips and efforts uh, that they could do um, in, in school. So we would try to provide them advice on um, you know, expectations around study time and what they could do for uh, um, uh, what they could do during that time to study effectively, where they could access help, um, and the kind of uh, advice that you would get normally if you were doing like a, a University 101 uh, class. Uh, but it was, and then we also followed up with text messages like this, some of the ones that you see here to try to motivate uh, to get the kids to um, remind them of things that they should be thinking about while they're doing their first year. But it was only when um, we had, instead of just text messages, the actual coach proactively tried to set up meetings weekly face-to-face, -face, did we actually find larger effects on academic achievement. So it was, um, despite uh, you know, a five-year effort to try to help students through text and uh, on a one-hour online exercise, it wasn't until we had the, um, the personal assistance that was real and face-to-face -face that actually generated the outcome. And another example is uh, the power of tutoring, a recent compilation of almost 100 randomized controlled trials examining the effects of small ratio supplementary assistance to reading or math 
found like almost 90% of these uh, programs were effective, and many of them were very large effective at improving um, reading and math academic ability. In fact, um, if you take a step back and look at tutoring on its own, it appears to be one of the most influential programs to improve academics and grade uh, school children. So I think there's a lot of consensus that if there was a way to provide more personal assistance for one-on-one -on -one learning, especially in reading and math, that would go a long way to help improve academic outcomes and, and make uh, every individual reach their potential. But it's expensive. Um, and often it can cost more than three or $4,000 a year to provide this kind of uh, tutoring. Uh, and, so, and that's true for many of the interventions that use personal connection. They don't scale well. They cost a lot of money because um, one p person, the whole point is that one person cannot provide that assistance to many people. It is the individual interaction that's sort of the secret sauce. Um, and so while many programs with personal assistance can generate large benefits, it's not clear about their cost effectiveness. So here's an example of how technology can help. Um, there's a, so in the case of tutoring, computer-assisted learning platforms have the potential to simulate the tutoring experience. So programs like Khan Academy, if you've ever heard of it, um, allow students to go online uh, to a topic of their level, progress at their own pace, receive immediate feedback, and if they make a mistake, they can receive suggestions to fix that mistake, and they can review the videos again. But the problem with the computer-assisted learning on its own is no student wants to do it. You can't just say, go off and, and um, uh, work on this. They'd much rather be doing something else. But it's by combining this technology with a supervisor allows it for the potential to provide personal assistance at a larger scale. Rather than one-on-one, -on -one, a supervisor can help encourage students work through something like Khan Academy at a, a much larger ratio than one-to-one. -one. So um, as an example of the idea of the pilot project that we're doing in Toronto right now, we have um, uh, undergrads who work with teachers to try to create weekly assignments in class, and um, the teacher introduces the uh, assignment and allows a, an opportunity for the students to practice on the computer for an hour. But anyone who doesn't finish the assignment has the rest of the week to work on it at their own pace until they get the next assignment later. And then on top of that, we can layer on it for almost like a triage model, maybe not ev Maybe some people can, that's all they need to, um, to receive this personal instruction to go at their own pace for their help. But some who still struggle might benefit from even more personal assistance. So on top of this uh, um, effort to help in the classroom, we also have uh, the potential for a virtual tutor to help at home. So for the students that are struggling the most, the teacher emails the parent and offers them this program of receiving one hour of help um, at home. And the, the beauty of the two that go really well together because the tutor um, knows exactly what to help the student with. They go like really well together. And during that one hour, the tutor just has to ask the student to share their screen and go through the assignment. So while the student is going through the assignment, the tutor virtually is basically looking over their shoulder, trying to understand um, what's, going, uh, what's going on. So that's one example of trying to lower the cost. And uh, another example is trying to um, just foster a greater culture of volunteerism. If personalized assistants have such a large benefit, then uh, there could be a very large role for volunteers to play. And there has been a lot of research to suggest that the volunteer themselves actually benefits themselves through um, feeling um, you know, um, ha happier with their role. Um, there's been uh, some studies that show that their own academics improve, but also just in general that their own well-being of helping someone else actually makes them feel good. So I think there's a lot of potential for using both technology and fostering um, 
uh, more volunteerism to try to help foster and encourage more personalized assistance. Finally, I want to give you one more example. Okay, go back. Uh, here's an example that's not education related. In, in the 1990s, the federal government did this large um, experiment uh, in which lone parents on social assistance were given large temporary subsidies um, for getting back to work. And so um, if they got back to find full-time employment, um, their wages would be basically double than what they would normally make. But the subsidy was temporary. It only lasted uh, three years. The idea was to see if almost doubling the wages initially would be enough to uh, encourage those who could uh, get back to work and then stay working even after the subsidy kind of goes away. And for the main group of the study that received the subsidy, um, well, okay. So for the main group, um, parents uh, did go back to work faster but five years later, the control group that wasn't getting the subsidy had caught up, so there was no long-term impact. But there was a second group for the study that actually received um, concentrated personal assistance. In particular, lone parents in this group were each assigned an individual coach that proactively tried to meet with them very regularly, understand their problems, and f help them find uh, employment. And what was also key is, the help didn't end once they found work. The, the coach kept working with them to help encourage them to stay at work, to deal with the problems um, once they did get work, and also to keep an eye on um, future career trajectory. And uh, it was the second group, I think I have a picture here. Um, it was the second group that uh, found even past the five years, earnings on average were $3,000 a year higher compared to the comparison group for 20 years. Um, and the difference between the main group and the other was that you had someone who cared and the program recipient was more motivated, more empowered. So just to give you an idea of like, you know, just one of the testimonials, um, when these guys were interviewed, they really conveyed how important that interaction was. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, the, uh, so the main conclusion is uh, we have this problem that people over overemphasize the present or ignore better options when making decisions involving immediate costs and long-term benefits. Um, Making preferred actions easier to take and more salient can help, but um, I feel that nudges on their own uh, is not going to help transform the long-run uh, habits that we want to see. So my conjecture, what I offer you today, is that if we really want meaningful change through public policy, we're going to have to accept that we need some kind of personal assistance. Figuring out a way to make that cost effective is going to be a big challenge. Um, but I think it's possible, and um, I hope we can find a way to see more of that. Thank you. I mean, I think the only other thing that comes immediately to mind is that if there's a way to fo foster like a, a cultural change, I think one of the reasons why something like that can be effective is that, again, it, it's uh, uh, people seeing other people use, you know, the bicycle, and and so it it there's a critical mass of a change that makes it more likely for everyone to want to do it. 
And, and so um, I think it is an interesting example of thinking about encouraging large-scale changes, like sort of the example I was giving with volunteerism. Um, like I'm, I'm trying to set up a, a volunteer tutoring program at, at my university, and I think that it's only going to, you know, it would work better if there was sort of some, um, you know, if everyone around you was doing it, then you're more likely to do it. And so I think that's where the connection is a little bit with your urban planning with your example. Got another question over here. Order, order, over there. I'm pointing. Sure. Um, so uh, almost all of the examples I use now <coughs> are with randomized experiments, sort of like uh, a lot of us doing applied work, uh, sort of our main challenge is to try to figure out how to parse out um, you know, true causal relationships. And then, at least for me, I got a little bit tired of trying to use quasi-random uh, techniques and spend my entire talk trying to convince you that I really do have uh, talk. So the advantages of doing an experiment is that most people understand that whatever you randomize, you're looking at. The problem with that, though, is you can't always randomize what you want. And um, also setting up these types of programs, um, the, the research turns more into project management and managing fire after fire. And so there's a real um, challenge in making sure that what you end up testing is what you want to test. Um, and so in the case of uh, the tutoring, for example, um, you know, you, we do our best at training the teachers to use Khan Academy in the way that we think is most effective, but then um, you know, trying to get 300 teachers to change you know, how they've been teaching for years uh, some of, uh, it's more successful for, for some than for others. And so then when you have the results, it, it makes it harder. So, I mean, we can talk, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting question because I, it's what we spend, or what I spend most of my time on is worrying about how to set up these experiments and um, takes up a lot more time and, and is less economics than project management, yeah. Reese. Thank you. Um, thanks, Phil. So you've described nudges and um, shoves, right. So in nudges, the uh, situation is not to foreclose other options, but to have a default. OK? In shoves, you foreclose other options, as I take it. But most economic policy and policy thinking operates in the middle where you've changed the relative price of something or, or the relative costs, and people are neither foreclosed or it's intermediate. But my question is whether the Chinese government has been reading Cass and Sunstein with what I think they call it social credit, which has also a different meaning in British Columbia, <laughs> a former policy, but where people with their smartphone, um, they're given credits for doing the right thing, they're penalized for doing the wrong thing, they're, they may be foreclosed from doing certain things because their social credit is too low. And they seem to be using these in a mass way with an enormous population. Um, any thoughts on that? Okay, so the, uh, there's a lot of discussion around the ethics of um, behavioral policies, whether they be nudges or shoves. Um, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that the policymaker doesn't know for sure 
what's in the best long run interest of the individual. They're kind of making um, uh, sort of uh, educated guesses. But a lot of this motivation starts off from um, uh, pointing out things like uh, when you're setting a default, you're implicitly making a choice on whatever that default is. And so you must make some decision. Um, one of the attractions of a nudge is that you're still trying to keep all options open while still um, uh, ending up setting up you know, one type, uh, making it easier than others. There are examples of um, uh, obvious situations where nudging would improve it, where um, there's, say, money available from someone being eligible for a program, they just have to complete an application, right? And so um, we have studies saying just, you know, it's an example where um, someone is not optimizing, not doing something in their best interest if they just have to fill out this form to get $1,000. Um, the, you know, the shoves are a more complicated case. I have spent some time thinking about compulsory schooling, right? Uh, when you set a minimum age of which someone has to stay in school, a lot of the times the motivation is that a student is sort of too young to make such a, a long-term consequential decision. So, and the minimum schooling leaving age has changed over time. It used to be 12 and then 14, 16, uh, now it can be even be like 18, and it sort of uh, creeps up with sort of some sentiment. Um, but it, uh, if you look at the legislation, it has some ways of having exceptions. But ideally, these types of um, shoves uh, can also sort of serve as setting um, uh, sort of expectations around what might be beneficial actions. I mean, getting back to your specific example on China, uh, I'm not sure if I have like any specific response uh, on that. I think that um, you know, like I guess the examples I was using in schooling, you can use, say, like what a teacher is covering in class. Uh, the teacher has a lot of control over presenting something that might be, uh, you might not want them to cover in class or might be objectionable. And I think we have to handle that power with care. So um, hopefully we're kind of thinking about it carefully. That's all I guess I'm going to say about that. I, I feel like you know one of the the kind of essential questions for personalized assistance <coughs> is how long does it need to go for in order for it to be permanent, or maybe it is never permanent, but sort of what is sort of the relationship between the length of, or what do we know about the relationship between? between kind of the length of the personalized assistance and then sort of how long the effects last for or, or the amount of time you need to do it for to cross some threshold to then become permanent? So it's a good question. I'm going to suggest that one of the, um, you know, the reasons why some of these efforts for personal assistance, they help some but not others because you know, uh, context matters and matching of the, you know, the student or the personal, the person providing the personal assistance matters. And sometimes it's going to be effective with just, uh, you know, a short period of time and others are going to need a, a longer period of time. I mean, when you think about um, all the personal assistance that a parent provides, it goes on for a long time, right? And um, maybe some people need that kind to, um, for something to stick. So I don't think there's, I mean, it's hard enough to set up a study for even a short period of personal assistance, 
but it, you know, it, it would be nice to have a specific uh, research agenda to kind of look and understand that. So tutoring is another example to try to understand whether someone just needs one year of tutoring or needs you know, three or four years of tutoring before that they are you know, okay on their own. So the short answer, I don't think we really know, but uh, I think it's an important question. Um, I have a question on the cost effectiveness um, of this and the scalability. Um, so let's say you're talking about uh, trying to get people to study more, st school kids, right? Um, put more time into study. Uh, you can do this with nudges, with the text messaging. That seems pretty uh, cheap. And uh, there might be shoves you can do, although I can't think of anything reasonable right now. But then you can do these personal assistants who can help people study. But you can also just do, just pay them, like monetary incentives. Um, I remember there's, there have been these large scale experiments in the States for literally paying kids to put in study time and doing the homework. And they seem to be comparatively effective. So I guess my question is, are you, what would be interesting is to see what's more cost effective, right? I mean, it's, it's also costly to just pay people to do things. In, in the case of your, your stairs, you could have a collection box. Every time you walk the stairs, you get a dollar. Um, and that would get people walking the stairs. So, um, you know, and that's not necessarily more cost effective, obviously, than a personal assistant. But um, wouldn't it be interesting to look at that? To say, okay, so what, what's the, what's the trade-off here? So I think, um, I don't know, a few years ago, a lot of us got this idea uh, to try this, to try to um, pay students to do better. It, and it sort of matched up with this theory that if, if the reason why students weren't studying or working harder were because they were so focused on immediate costs, let's just offset the immediate cost with an immediate benefit in order to realize an even larger uh, benefit later on. And so, uh, you know, several people were trying these uh, experiments at different levels of paying kids to do better grades, um, to achieve uh, college credits. I had a program where we were paying uh, first year undergrads like three, four thousand dollars if they could get an A. And um, I think all of us reached sort of the conclusion that this was not uh, that effective. That you, you, sometimes you found little uh, responses, but the amount of money that you spent for people who would have already gotten that money, um, it was really hard. I mean, it would be really amazing if you could accurately predict what someone's grade would be, and then you would only have to customize. You just say, well, we're only going to pay you if you do better. Right? That's kind of the idea, but it's really hard to predict, and as a result, it ends up being really expensive. So that's kind of my experience with trying to, to pay. I don't, I, I don't want to just debate this, but there are studies where they pay kids for more homework. So not for outcomes, but for impact. So it, and, and those seem to be, I mean, what I've read, quite effective. So that's all I'm saying, is that there's, there's an alternative here, um, which, is, which is paying people. And depending on what you're looking at, again, it might be, that might be actually more complicated. So, you, I mean, I don't know. You might be thinking of this as one study in the QJE uh, where there were five separate experiments. And there was uh, four of them were ineffective, but there was one that was effective. And it was the one they were paying to do inputs. So the reading and it said, but um, so maybe it's an intriguing idea if we sort of pay them to do the action that we want, like studying. Uh, but it was one out of five. And so I, I would want to see more like, research showing consistently that that type of incentive works. Uh, I wasn't sort of fully convinced from that one study that that was uh, pointing to like, the solution. If I'll Okay. So you focused on like experts and novice um, kind of mentoring, but what about peer groups? And have you thought about, say, how 
um, you can kind of create environments that encourage effective peer groups that kind of provide a similar level of support. I mean, for, all, for those of us who are, you know, econ profs, we all remember studying for a comps and having a study group who, you know, at least in my case, I learned a lot from, um, and that's kind of what I have in mind. Um, yeah, I think that the, the potential to kind of have personal assistance through peers is there. Um, I think there might be, uh, the one I think often is, again, uh, tutoring. Where Ideally, your personal assistant is someone who gives you the right advice that you need to know uh, and, and is trustworthy that this is someone that I want to follow and give that advice. And so if you have that with a peer, that's great. In a study environment, I think there's the potential that um, the personal assistance is not the same kind as the examples that we're talking about because um, you're all kind of collectively, there's no sort of expert uh, or role model or mentor or coach that is playing that role in the peer. So I, I think it's possible, but m maybe it's a bit different. Maybe it's a different yeah, I, th I think there's lots of, it, these are, this is a very context specific question, right? I'm sure there are specific examples where we could come up with peer environments that could be potentially leading to this kind of personal system that we're talking about. So um, it's an empirical question for a you know, specific problem that we would want to think through and then try it out. It, it, it seems like a lot of times for younger children, it, it kind of divides like this. So for older children, we try to find outside people to be this personal assistant, to be this mentor. And then for younger children, there's often a lot of efforts to try to coach the parent to be the personal assistant and, and mentor. And I was wondering, is there any work on trying to sort of coach the parents of older students to be better personal assistants or mentors and sort of on the effectiveness of that? I feel like that's kind of less, less talked about. But it seems like it would be always be easier if you could just make the parent a better parent, like because that's the person you have the most contact with. So I mean, if we had the advice on what actually does make a good parent, that, I would love to know that myself. <laughs> uh, for the younger one, you know, I think we know something, and that there's clearly a, a gap in what we think more parents should be doing. So I think it's a good place to start. I'm certainly receptive to the idea that. Um, kids are um, malleable for some of those activities and that the return on investment from encouraging more of that social interaction or ex exposure to different experiences is very good. At the older ages, it's, it's not as obvious. And for anyone working on education policy, you get a little bit discouraged from you know, the, the, the more this credible the study is, often the smaller the effect that we find. And um, and it's a bit uh, yeah discouraging, disheartening, and so that's why um, you know th there are some studies that show trying to foster non-cognitive skills at really young ages seems to be useful, helping parents at young ages, and that's why I'm sort of excited about tutoring because I think that it's one program that seems to be that if we only could do more customization for learning, that would be another thing. But I don't think there's like a lot of mm, obvious advice to provide a parent of a teenager that's going to like solve everyone's problems. If, if someone knows, please let me know. I could really use that. Yeah. Basically, we're doing a peer tutoring, which works so well. Because, you know, as a teenager, they will not like their mom or dad teach them or tutor. It's better like their buddy, like their friends. They come there and help. The seniors, grade 12, help the grade 8, grade 9. And then it's, it's credited for their volunteer time, like, you know, like work experience thing. And it's so great that I think they'll, con I don't know how many years ago they started it, but it works so well. 
and I work in the special needs students. So um, totally, I agree with you, tutoring, like even peer tutoring, um, because sometimes, you know, parents, when their kids are in their, you know, teenage, like, you know, teenagers, they don't kind of, they, oh, they're old enough, you know, their friends can help them, something like that. So I agree, like, it depends on the ages. So primary, like elementary, parents should involve, you know, like for my own experience, I have three boys now in their college age. So I started like elementary, like, you know, after like teachers give all the lesson plan and then I work, I buy workbooks, like teach, like tutor them. And then high school, their friends come in and then college, they're off to go online or whatever. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hold on, question in America. Um, so since you're on the topic of tutoring, I'm part of a peer tutoring program here at SFU, and what ends up happening some semesters is that we have more peer tutors signed up than people who might need the tutoring program who sign up for the tutoring program. And in university, there is this focus on independence for students, so you can't really force the students to sign up for tutoring programs. And uh, for example, if someone's out of a job, there is work BC programs that they can sign up for to get one-on-one -on -one counseling, but you can't really force them to sign up for those things. So um, is there any research on how we can self-motivate individuals to like sign up for these programs? Or before we imbe like invest in large-scale tutoring programs, how can we make sure that motivation is there to sign up for these programs? Right, so that's um, like these are good points because um, in some cases you need both the personal assistance and the shove to kind of make the interaction happen. There was a, a recent study that showed even if you make uh, tutoring available 24-7, um, but the student actually, you can inform them, you can inform the parents, but they have to actually access it only a very small fraction actually do. This is at all, more at the uh, elementary and high school level, but it's, all, it's also at the university level as well. And so that's why um, utilizing the structure of the school, I think, is a big advantage. At least this is why we're, we're trying to work with teachers, because it, um, it shoves the students into receiving the personalized learning. Um, I think that, you know, in a university setting, it's hard a thing to do, like you say, because you know you're trying to celebrate independence. But as a result, um, you know, it's more difficult. Maybe this is also another example of where, um, at least at the margin, reminders uh, or just making the tutoring easier to access uh, can be useful. I find like, you know, my students just forget of all the services that are available to them, and and just you know, it goes in one year out the other in the first week, and then they forget. And maybe having a professor remind them that, you know, right after class, they can go access a tutor. These kind of things um, might make it easier, more likely to happen. Yeah. Well, um we're going to defer that one, and uh, let's uh, take a moment to thank Phil, and then we'll move on.